Okay, welcome to our fall study of the book of Galatians. We are studying the biblical letter of Paul to Galatia, and it may have been one of the earliest Pauline letters, and we'll talk about that tonight as we introduce the book. So um, welcome, everybody, and we're going to start right away with the text. So will someone please read Galatians 1, 1 through 5? Okay, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I think that's a whole sermon right there. It, it really is. And actually, we're going to go back and talk about the content of that prayer some next week, too, um, unless we have time this week, in which case we will. But um, so when we study a biblical book, it's great to start with genre, authorship, audience, date, purpose, kind of those overarching questions of like putting this book into the place. So sort of like, how do we understand this book? Where does it live? So let's start with genre. What what does genre mean? Like, what, what do we understand that to be? Type. Type, okay. Is that like letter, mystery, fiction, that sort of thing? Exactly, yeah. Type, letter, you know, and some examples would be like narrative, right? What, what in the Bible is narrative? Hmm. Acts. Acts, yeah. Acts is our big narrative New Testament book. Gospels are kind of narrative, but they have kind of their own thing going on, right? Old mm -hmm. Testament, there's a ton of narrative. What's a, some exa an example of narrative in the Old Testament? Book of Esther, Book of Ruth. Yeah. Yeah, it's telling a story, right? It's prose and it's telling a story. We have other categories, other genres all through, you know, the Bible, even though it's one thing, it's not one thing, right? So many different um, types of material. There's prophecy, there's, um, there's like law codes, there's poetry, there's um, wisdom literature, right? And they all have their own characteristics. So why would we start with genre? Why would that matter to us? Because you want to know who it's written to and why it was written. Yeah, it's going to be uh, like, okay, so if, if uh, what, what's Galatians? A letter. It's a letter. It's a letter. So because it's a letter, it's written directly to somebody, you just said, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's written from somebody and to somebody. And what else is specific about a letter? Well, it's the voice of the writer. Yeah, um, that writers of uh, feelings, thoughts, ideas, viewpoints. Right. In um, we don't have a lot of first person in the narrative stories, right? But in a letter, he he says, "I did this, I did that." Right. What else? It is grace and peace be with you from God the Father and Jesus Christ. Yeah, we get that introduction. He's giving them greetings. You get, you get the sense right away from this text that Paul is writing into a specific situation, right? So this is always, this is the case with the letters. We're, we're, and this is why it's important that we, we start out with this in our mind is that we're reading someone's mail, right? And we don't know what was said back and forth outside of this letter. And so we have to work at it. We're going to have to look and see like, well, what was going on? What specific context is he writing into? You know, we're going to talk next week. Next week, I've given you like a little sequence of passages so that we can try to understand the situation that Paul was writing into because they had some drama going on. And what was it? 
what what was what was it about and so we'll talk that'll be like our our whole main topic next week but when we have a letter anytime you know this time there's obviously there's some drama but like we did philippians some of you were with me when we studied philippians it was writing specific people into a specific context so we always have to know that that we're reading someone else's mail we're going to have to do some interpretation what part applies to just them you know if he says greet so-and-so, you know, that's meant for them in that moment, in that time. And yet we also know there's so much meant for us. And so we have to do the work to figure that out, right? Letters began in the ancient world with a common formula. We would normally like, what, what's the formula for a letter in, in our habits or, you know, culture? Well, you start with a greeting and you end with a signature and a sign off. Yeah. Um, so we would we would normally put the date up at the top, right? No yeah. date on this. So sad. We wish we had a date um, for the Galatians. We would normally put the date. We might put our own information at the top, but we might just start with a greeting and end with a signature. The opening formula for a letter in the ancient world was from and then to and then a greeting. And then Paul usually goes into a prayer and often he goes into Thanksgiving. Um, his, the Thanksgiving portion has been replaced in Galatians with him fussing at them because he's, he's worked up, right? But, but we start with a from and to. So let's look at that. Who is this from? First one and to. It's from Paul. Yes, Paul. What does he say about himself? He's not from man or through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Right. He starts right off by saying his position as well as his name, right? Now, we know a little bit about Paul. We know that which Paul this is. What Paul, what Paul are we talking about? He was the one that Jesus opened his eyes on the road to Damascus. Yeah, this is the one we have so many stories about in Acts, right? He is the apostle who met Jesus on the road, um, became a, a devotee of Jesus because of that encounter, and then um, started going out, doing missionary work, you know, telling the good news, right? He's, this is Paul the apostle, and we know about him from the book of Acts. And then who else is it from? Jesus Christ and God the Father. Okay, so he's so he comes in the authority of mm -hmm. Jesus and God the Father um, in his apostleship, definitely. And then what other people? Look at verse two. All the brothers. Yeah, so this is a word for brethren, which um, could be is the generic for a group. You know, um, the, the masculine form is used for a group. So your translation may say brothers, it may say brethren, it may say brothers and sisters. Um, so this is the, the people who are with him. And he was probably in his home church of um, Antioch when he wrote this. Um, uh, the, and when we read Acts 13 and 14, we see that he started out in Antioch they commissioned him to go and preach, and then he returned to Antioch. And this is, we don't know. Um, he didn't put that in the letter where he was writing from. Um, in some of his letters, he says he's writing from prison. But this doesn't appear to be one of these. He's probably writing from Antioch. And so this is, this is the church. Why does he mention the brothers and sisters of the church that are with him as part of the senders of this letter? Wouldn't they have all been with him? Some of them have been with him when he was there. We went to Galatia and they knew them. And he's yeah, like, Barnabas hey, John went. says hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does not say Barnabas's name, but Barnabas went with him in that first journey. And um, yeah, so, so they might know, they might know some of those people. Yeah, why else?
maybe because they're all in agreement that the letter needed to be written and it's not just him saying it. And so other people know too, and they agree with me. Right. I think that's really, I think there's some, some weight to that here that he is writing on behalf of, you know, in his apostleship on behalf of Jesus and in agreement with the church. Right. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I have the authority to say these things packed into these first verses, right? Just right away in his introduction of who he is and who is sending the letter. Okay, so great point. All right, so that's our audience. I said we do genre audience and this this letter already is telling us the from and the, so the two is who? Who is this to? To the churches in Galatia. To the churches in Galatia. So, um, what, who's that? Anyone, um, if you had a chance to do your readings in Acts, um, who would this be? The Iconium Church, Lystra, and Derby. And I'm looking at a map that has two Antiochs on it. I'm sorry, is he in the Antioch in Asia or the one in Syria? Good point. This can be confusing. So when Paul is based out of Syrian Antioch, okay. it is like just up from Jerusalem. And then Pisidian Antioch is over in Galatia. So okay. uh, modern day Turkey on the way to Greece. So I, I'm, I'm motioning like he's going above the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and it's the direction that would be right for me, but I, it may be mirrored for you. I don't know. Um, but yeah, if you think of a map with the Mediterranean Sea in the middle and Greece and Turkey and you know the Israel over here, he's in Syria, Syrian Antioch, and he takes a boat um, and then up and then he visits these churches in Galatia. And those visits are in Acts 13 and 14. So those cities are Southern Galatia. And many scholars, and I, I might dare to say most, I'm not sure, I think so, would say that these, this letter is to the churches in southern Galatia. Paul visits, and we get detailed accounts of these city of his visits to southern Galatia in these first um, this first journey. Later, you know, we talked about how Paul goes back on mission multiple times. He visits these cities multiple times. He also just goes through Galatia a couple of times, and he could have gone through northern Galatia. And there are some scholars who think, well, there were, this sounds like it's written to all Gentiles, and there's a bunch of Jews in southern Galatia, so maybe this is really written to northern Galatia. I, I don't think so. I don't, it doesn't quite all add up and, you know, they're going to still argue about it and that's okay. I think it's okay if we think of this as those churches in Southern Galatia, the ones that we met in Acts. Um, questions on that? There's no detail. There's never any detail about the churches in Northern Galatia or Paul visiting there. So we have a lot of detail about Southern Galatia. It was a little... Um, the roads were better in the south, and so it's more likely to travel in the south. The north had less um, Greek speakers. Koine Greek was the language throughout the Roman world, but not everywhere had really good Greek speakers. And the northern Galatia was more of a barbarian area and had less Greek speakers and less proficient um, population in Greek. So, you know probably Southern Galatia, we would say. So um, think about those visits. What were the churches like and what were Paul's visits like in Acts when he, when he went to those churches, when he went to those cities? Because they weren't churches until he went there, right? He founded those churches. Well, in one of the cities, the... Um everybody when he healed somebody everybody decided he was uh, he and Barnabas were gods and yes. started giving you know um offerings to them they were like hey they, no sorry misunderstood right horrified right terror clothes horrified to be treated mm -hmm. as a god and then what happened he straightened him out yes and how how, how did he, how was he rewarded for straightening them out oh they probably drove him out 
by stoning him or something. <laughs> exactly. I don't remember. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there was there a, there was a lot of oh, Shirley. Were you saying something? Okay, I guess not. So there was a lot of turmoil right all through these there's all this jewish interest for paul's message we especially see this in the first city in pisidian antioch but then there's all this jewish hostility and these cities become stirred up and one group is against the other group and they're riling them up and they're driving paul out of town and paul and barnabas um are in they're beaten and sent away and they go on to the next city it's it's a it's a, a harrowing uh, time for them as they go through these cities. And they, it says, um, if we look at 14.3, Acts 14.3, we can kind of get a little mm -hmm. summary of how things went. This is when he's still in Iconium. This is right before the, the incident in Lystra where they're treated as Zeus and Hermes. Um, 14.3, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord. Do you remember that when Acts talks about people speaking boldly, they're normally speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. So speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders and the people of the city were divided and some sided with the Jews and some sided with the apostles and there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them this is how things went in these cities right there was boldness there was power of the spirit there was opposition and there were plots against them and that this happened over and over in this sequence of cities. And Paul and Barnabas would leave in danger. And later they, but as even though they left in danger, they would have planted a group of brethren there that was the beginning of a church. And then later it says they would come back and strengthen the churches. So this was their, you know, they they walk through fire. For these young churches, for these cities, for the believers in these cities, it was it had to have been extremely um, roller coastery in terms of their emotion and their investment and their injuries and their um, being help, you know, accepting help and being driven out and then being taken in by the next group. So it was a, a tumultuous period as they go through these cities and they come back and they come back to Antioch and their summary of their trip this is in 1427 is that God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles so they come back you know through injury you know stone to to the point that they they think he's dead they leave him for dead and when they leave he gets up and goes into the city and gets his wounds tend to you know through all of that hardship their report is, is the, the joy of having the door of faith open to the Gentiles. And that is the audience that we're talking about that's now receiving this letter. Questions or comments on that? So the next thing we would like to have is a date. We wish he had put it in the upper corner of his letter like we think he's supposed to. Um, but we think this was probably written, uh, one, one, scholars are divided. <laughs> this is another one of those, right? One good possibility is that is, this is written right after they come back from the first missionary journey from Antioch. So the timeline in that case would be that the missionary journey is around 47, 48 um, AD. Uh, and uh, then this incident that we're going to read about with Peter and Antioch in chapter two, um, he, Paul and Peter have a little, little, little showdown argument. And Paul relates this as part of the story of the letter. And that would have probably happened in 48. And then after that point, he hears that some, this same problem, the problem that we're going to really delve into next week uh, between kind of a Jew and Gentile thing has been happening in Galatia. He hears about that and he writes this letter to the Galatians. 
So that would put this letter right around 48 AD. Now, the other possibility is that, um, that maybe some of the story in here is talking about the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And if it is, then this letter would have been written after, a little later, maybe, you know, maybe 50, somewhere around in there. Um, the, we can talk about how that timeline, because Paul gives a, he gives a lot of personal history in Galatians that he doesn't give anywhere else. But, you know, think about like, if you were to tell the story of your whole summer um, with even just, or, you know, your life since you had children, even, because he covers a number of years, your life since you had children um, and your spouse were to tell the life since you had children or you were to tell the story of your career or someone who knows you, you know, a good friend was to tell the story of your career. Those would come out differently, wouldn't they? Like just out of the natural uh, perspective, difference in perspective, right? So Luke's account, when we, when we studied Acts, we talked about how Luke had, couldn't fit in everything. He chose what to put in for theological reasons well when Paul tells the story we go like hmm is he talking about the same thing that Luke was talking about there or is that a different thing you know and so we get a lot of like we have to work hard to kind of line it up and, and try to figure out who's talking about what so that's the difficulty and what what I think is that the Jerusalem council had not happened yet and that he's but his his uh confrontation with Peter had, and he's writing them at that point um, before going to the Jerusalem Council. And it's all about this Jew versus Gentile issue. Thoughts, questions, comments? Paul's well, definitely in the early period of these churches right? These churches are early in their understanding of trying to figure out what it means to follow God. What does it mean to be accepted by God? And what do you have to do to be accepted by God? And so he's addressing that at a point where they don't understand it. And he is going to great lengths to explain it. And that's part of the purpose of this letter right? We see this sort of Jew Gentile thing come out right away, even in Paul's traditional greeting that he uses. He uses this greeting, um, Shirley pointed this out, grace and peace, right? This happened, this, he uses it in many of his letters. Let's talk about grace and peace. So ancient letters normally had the word greetings, um, car, right? Car, I, wish I had looked up how to pronounce this, Kareen, C-H-A-I-R-E-I-N, Kareen. Um, it's a greetings, but it's related to the word charis, which is grace, C-H-A-R-I-S, grace. And so he uses sort of a take on the Greek greeting for his greeting for them, grace. And then what's the other half of his greeting? Peace. Peace. And what group of people do we know who greet each other with a word for peace? And Jewish people. Jewish people. Yeah. Shalom. Yeah. Shalom. Yeah. It's the, the Jewish word for peace, but it's a, a wholeness, wellness, right? It's a may you have wholeness, wellness of being, shalom. And so he's already combining a Greek address with his Jewish heritage, grace and peace in how he's greeting them. So Jew and Gentile together is coming out from the earliest moments of the letter, right? And then he, he flows directly into this beautiful prayer, um, which we're going to talk more about next week. And then, um, and then he just launches in to his, um, his, beef 
with them, I guess, right? I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you. So if you had time to skim through, or if you want to skim through now, what do you think the tone of Galatians is like? I'm thinking he has come from such brutal situations. He's probably frustrated and angry. He, he sounds angry, doesn't he? Doesn't. There is some anger behind this letter. Yeah, what else? Frustrated, angry, what else? Seems like he spends a lot of time with history too. I need to go back and retell various parts of, of Jewish history, of Christian, of Christ and his history. He's using that to correct, isn't he? So there is a strong tone of correction that runs through. He's got, there's some anger, there's some frustration, there's a tone of correction. Anything else jump out at you? I was gonna say scolding, so correction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is, he is fired up and he is not afraid to let them know it. Now, is this, an, do you think Paul just dashed this off? Is this an example of writing angry? Mm -hmm. So the way that um, letters had to be written in the ancient world, the ancient world for, you know, literacy, of course, was lower than it is for our culture. But also what literacy meant was reading, not writing. Writing is as, as a trade. So, you know, we think of learning to read and learning to write as two sides of the same coin. But that was not the case in the ancient world. You might learn to read without ever learning to do anything more about rudimentary writing, very little, limited. And so when you wrote a letter that you hired, that this was something you hired us done, a secretary would write your letter for you. Secretaries knew um, rhetorical formulas. They knew the titles to use. They knew the formats to use. And um, the, the person who was writing were a group of people. Remember, Paul and the brethren with me. So it, these were often done very cooperatively, right? They would go, they would tell the content to the secretary, the secretary would write it up, and then they would go through a time of revision. They would use wax tablets to write on and then correct and then write up until the final version was put on parchment. And then the author of the letter had to make sure that they really meant everything in the letter. So the, this process does not lend itself. This is not like midnight email writing, right? Nobody is like, they're mad and you're writing an email in the middle of the night and you just send it off before you think about it. In the morning, you're like, well, I was really mad last night. That's not what Paul is doing, right? He has had to go through the revision process and he chose to leave in this passion, all this emotion. He's hurt by them, isn't he? Like we can see mm -hmm. this as we go through that their, the, their um, desertion or their change or their, the, the, the way that they have turned to another idea away from the idea that he is so passionately defending is he thinks it's worth the emotion here. So we, we definitely get that coming through in the letter. So I would say we have four themes coming out of Galatians. And the first is um, that, you know, as I said, in those first couple of verses, there's a lot of, I have the authority to tell you this coming out in those first two verses, Paul defends his apostleship. And he's going to spend um, the first couple of chapters, chapter and a half, really just saying, this is my history as an apostle. This is why I'm qualified to tell you this. So he has to, if he feels he has to defend himself, what does that say about his situation probably? Probably feeling attacked or not believed. Yeah, he, he believes he is under attack and it comes out in the letter. We're going to talk, see next week that there are some rival evangelists that have come in and told the Galatians things that are not what Paul would have them be told. And 
it is probably the case that these rival evangelists have said, Paul's just a people pleaser. He's just trying to give you the easy version of the gospel. Because there are times in here that Paul says, you think I'm a people pleaser now? Would I be saying this if I were a people pleaser? You know, so um, he says, I swear to you, I'm not lying. Well, maybe he's been accused of lying, right? So Paul is under attack and he defends his apostleship. We see why this would matter to them. Why would, th why would this matter to us? This could happen to anyone in any day because I noticed in chapter six, it says, I am amazed at how you quickly uh, deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Yeah. Um, that really that, my mind. Yeah. Verse six. Yeah. One six. Yeah. So this, um, so he feels the need to like bring them back to the gospel as he's teaching it, which is different from how they're teaching it. Yeah. And we do see different, ver like, What's important about the gospel? Well, what's important about Christianity? We have these situations, right? Where we have Christians who are passionate and one says, well, the important thing is these things. And the other one's like, no, the important thing is these things, right? So we mm -hmm. have those situations. What else? Well, it's telling us he has authority. He's reminding us of that authority as well. Yeah, because um, what, what's in the New Testament? Letters. <laughs> Paul's letters right there's we have the gospels we have acts and then you know in between there and um the apocalypse the, the revelation of john it's all letters and lots of them are paul's so we too want to know can we can we trust this person who is writing this letter is he does he really have in mind the things of christ what is his what is his pedigree and can we trust it? And so this comes down to us as well, where we hear, like he says, he, he gives the account of himself, right? This is why I can be trusted. This Jesus said this to me directly, right? And we care about eyewitnesses, right? And the Bible continues to point out, oh, here's an eyewitness account. Here's an eyewitness account, right? And so we have that emphasis on witness and on um, the, the authenticity of the message coming to us. Okay, so theme one, Paul uh, defends his apostleship. Theme two, I would call um, justified by faith in Jesus. Uh, this is, some, you know, Paul will say this multiple times, like you're not justified by the law, you are justified by the faith, faith in Jesus. Now, what does justified mean? What do we mean by faith? The, all of that we're going to really delve into um, and, and get, get um, I guess, it, even in down into the word level to study that, because I think that really matters. That said a lot in Galatians to be, to be justified or um, brought into rightness with God by faith trust in Jesus is a theme of this letter, something that we care about too. How do we get into wellness and wholeness in our relationship with God? What, how does that happen? Okay, so that's theme two. Three is um, Jew and Gentile as heirs together. He's going to talk multiple times about how um, it's one body, there's no, you know, we have the famous verse, there's no longer um, Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You know, the, the mm -hmm. unified body, especially the emphasis is on Jew and Gentile here and how they are heirs together of the promise is a major theme. And then um, it all points to Christ living in me, the new creation, Christ in me, a new creation is that fourth theme. So that sense of like 
I am reformed in the power of the spirit. And that what it means to be justified by faith in Jesus is to live in the power of the spirit, to be transformed. And that's, you know, that's where the whole letter is pointing. That's why those last couple of chapters are about a lot about what it's like to live life in the spirit and live it together. So those four themes definitely come out. Questions or comments, thoughts on that? So um, I sent some study questions. Um, and I'm going to do that every week. I'll have them up. Um, for those of you who are on Linda's email with the church, you'll get those. But um, I'll also have them on my little web page for this study so that you can see the study questions every week. And um, I think. I, what did what did y'all think about how if if Galatians is is hard or easy? Did did you have a sense of that or a reaction about that? I think it's deep. Deep. He gets into some very deep deep topics because he's so passionate about yeah. uh, unity and love for Christ and those things that you, you know, the justification and faith. And I think he's seeing these little churches he started and he's seeing faith slipping away. They're struggling with their faith early on. He's definitely worried about them and it comes about in his passion. Yeah, absolutely. And that can be kind of obscuring to us, right? Because we're not there, we're not in that situation, you know. And so I think that in some ways that makes the book a little mysterious to us. We're like, he's really mad about something, right? Mm -hmm. What else? What else did you notice? Did anyone read like preview or skim through the section on Abraham, or the section on Hagar and Sarah? Mm -mm. These are weird, y'all. There are some weird, uh, he, Paul uses these Old Testament stories of Abraham and of Hagar and Sarah, and he uses them in ways that we would not. They are um, surprising. Uh, he He's like, um, and so this is like Jesus and we're like, really, it is like Jesus. Cause it was like, you know, thousands of years before Jesus. So does that matter? Um, there, there's some, there's some different use of scripture that we're really going to have to puzzle through and we can, it's, it's, it's going to be great, but it's like, uh, a little, it's a little mind, um, bending, to, to have to figure out what is he doing in this logic, this argument he's making using Abraham? What is he doing with this Hagar and Sarah? And this is the Jerusalem that's above and that's the Jerusalem that's below. And it can be a little confusing. I think Galatians is kind of hard, um, but I think that it's going to be so rewarding. And part of what's really rewarding about puzzling through how he's using that Old Testament, those Old Testament stories to make this new, this point about Jesus is that it tells us that the whole story of scripture is one story. And sometimes we don't think of it as one story, right? Sometimes we think about like, oh, that was the Old Testament God. Well, it's God. God is, you know, it's one, it's one God. Um, we have, uh, when we see the, the, the gentleness and the love of Jesus, and then we realize that is the character of God, the father as well. This is all one person or three persons in one God, um, the, the love of God continues all the way through this story from Abraham all the way to 
the Jesus that the Galatians met to the Jesus that we know. And so it will take some wrestling. Um, to that end, I have, I'm picking a memory verse for every week and putting those out with your study questions. So if you want to try it, it I find that when I memorize a verse, it gets into me, it gets into my mind in a way that it wouldn't have if I didn't try memorizing it. So it's a great thing to try. If you don't try memorizing it, then maybe that's your a theme verse for the lesson for the week to, you know, look at and dwell on. Um, either way, we're, we'll be wrestling with it as we go along. And scripture is, um, you know, it, sometimes we think, well, isn't it supposed to be easy? Aren't we supposed to be able to just accept Jesus and then we're all done? And um, yes and no, right? So yes, we ex the, our, our faith in Jesus is brings us into his presence and that is good. But scripture constantly talks about how meditating on the word of God is good for us right? Listen to this passage from Psalms 1. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. There's this sense of like, you have to chew on it, right? Scripture itself is telling us that what the the word has to just has to keep tumbling over in our mind and then listen to what it does this person will be plant like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season its leaf does not wither and whatever he does prospers so these ways of being healthy and whole and fruitful come from going over the scripture, thinking deeply on it and day and night, right? Um, so we see that in the, 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 the time it takes to understand these harder passages of scripture that when we, when we turn them over, they lead to wisdom, they lead to fruitfulness. And that is our goal for the study this semester, that we will be able to spend time in the word. The, the, the memory verse or theme verse, if you prefer, um, that I have for you this week is this prayer, right? That we opened with grace and peace to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Well, rescue is already an interesting word, right? This is a word that calls to mind the Israelites being rescued from Egypt, right? The, the, this, that great event that sort of foreshadows or prefigures Jesus's rescue of us. He rescues us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. You notice he's not just Jesus's God and Father, he's our God and Father as well. To whom be glory. Glory meaning the, the light that reveals the truth about the goodness of God. To the glory forever, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so already in this opening, we have kind of a pre-statement of, of what the good news is, right? He's going to in, in, go right to, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you and turning to a different gospel. What gospel did they start with? The gospel where Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age to the glory of God. So we start there and I'm looking forward to the whole semester. Next week, I'm having you read the opening passage and the closing passage of the book. And as you read this closing passage, you'll notice um, something else about letter writing in the ancient world. They did not sign their names at the end. They wrote their last paragraph in their unskilled handwriting as a signature. 
So look for that as you read this last passage. So first and last, we'll do one, one through 10 and six, uh, I think 11 through 18. Look, I have this written down. I don't have to try and figure it out. Yeah, six, 11 through 18. And then I have a passage out of chapter four and chapter five. So it'll be four, 17 through 20. This is all written down on that website. Five, seven through 12. These four passages kind of thread together to tell us, allow us to, to back out, you know, to, to read between the lines and figure out what was the backstory? What was the situation in Galatia? And that's what we'll do next time. Questions or comments? I'm a little disappointed that when you said the beginning and the end, you didn't go with the sandwich. <laughs> the Mark story has, has stuck. That's great. I like it. Mm -hmm. I don't. Is it a sandwich? Mm, I don't think so. But maybe if, if you find it, let, we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is this on a website? I do have a website for this. Um, if you go to my website, which is yannamunger.com, there's a big button across the top that says more info on the Galatians study. And if you mm -hmm. click that, all of the readings there's a little video of me telling like here's the blurb about the class there's um the whole schedule because remember we do three weeks and then there's a the last uh week of every month is like service project on tuesday mornings and then we can decide what we want to do for wednesday nights but i've kept the schedule the same so there's the schedule there's the reading assignments for every week and then i'll have those study questions and memory verses on there Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recorder so we can do prayer requests. Um, I, we, have, we haven't been together in so long. It'll be so good. Um,